Welcome into the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo with Sam Monson. Not happy, Sam. I asked you to do a grit test. You did not partake. We can't have this. I think that shows grit. Do the grit test. No. This is what we do here at PFF. We have to quantify things. And if you can't stare into my eyes for at least 15 seconds, it's changing my draft board. What can be more gritty than not taking your crap and refusing to accept the premise of the grit test? What do you think the correct answer is to the grit test? That. Don't no, do it. No, I'm not doing your stupid tests. Stop looking at me. For those who don't know, every year at the NFL Combine, we hear about ridiculous questions or things that come out of it. Guy gets punched in the chest, called up soft. The recent one was Lonnie Johnson, the cornerback from Kentucky, said that the Seattle Seahawks had him do a staring contest, essentially. For yeah. about 15, 16, he lasted 15 to 16 seconds. Now, I don't know if there's a threshold for good or bad, um, but that's what he hit, 15, 16 seconds. And, uh, Which won, when, apparently. I guess. And then uh, Jim Nagy, who runs the Senior Bowl, former Seattle Seahawks scout, responded to one of the tweets with just two words, grit test. Yeah. Essentially, like, I'm familiar with such test. Mm -hmm. That's our grit test. That's, that's our thing. That's what we do. We test grit. Yeah. I mean, we quantify a lot of stuff here at PFF. We haven't figured out grit. No. I just, I just, the NFL, I, I'm at a loss for words sometimes. The NFL evaluation process, I almost feel like I want to quit. And I, I think this is why I didn't get the job with the Bengals. I feel like I'm doing things the right way. We're trying to quantify things that matter at the next level. We've got thousands of snaps on tape for a lot of these guys. Thousands of snaps. You and we analyze every single one. Hold on. And we try to find out what they mean. And we do this year after year after year. And there are teams that are going to use a 10 to 15 second or how long, however long you last. They're going to use that staring grit contest and throw that into the evaluation somewhere. Yeah. What are we even doing here? You didn't have a list of questions that you would ask. Inappropriate, probably, you know. They've got to... Like some of these questions, by the way, have got to be breaking some form of, like, federal employment regulation. Well, now they are. You can't possibly be asking a guy if he's only got, you know, one nut. That can't be... That's got to be breaking a rule somewhere along the line. Surely. I think... We have a whole HR department that we have to skirt around. What do they want the answers to be is my question. What do you want the answers to be? Do you want to be a dog or a cat? And Joe Thomas... Thank you, Joe Thomas, for just... I mean, he helped so many prospects well, the other day. at least you can understand, right? Yeah, but Joe, but Joe Thomas... I don't mean it's said, listen, listen, prospects. Poor old line prospects weren't even watching. They were already in Indy. But the, the next three days of guys that were watching the Combine, they were like, hey, if, if they say dog or cat, you better say dog. Right. They're loyal and they're this and that and whatever. You know, but that cats. one at least I get, right? The, somewhere back in the fog of nonsense, you can at least see that there is a logical thought process to answering that question correctly. I would like to be a dog because they're loyal, they're team players, they're not isolated, lone servants of evil like cats. You have 15 minutes, right? though. So I'm not saying it's smart, but I'm saying you can at least what divine servants of evil, something like that. Why do you hate cats? I mean, the cats suck. Yeah, they're a red flag. Yeah. The cat so, guys are big red flags. Right. So I'm saying you can at least understand that, right? You can divine a something you're trying to glean out of that answer, right? Listen. You roll up and you ask a guy how many testicles has he got? What is, like, what? What are you trying to get out of that? I saw, I saw some response. Somebody said, look, the average male has less than two. Yeah. So you can say, hey, I'm, I'm above average. <laughs> what if that was the answer? I'm just, I, like, I, I get what you're trying to at least ascertain from the dog cat thing. What are you trying to find out with the nut question? I don't know. Right. I don't know. There's been some good ones. Some good ones. The brick test. The, what was that? I, I forget. what. what uh, ways to use a brick. How many different ways you'd use a brick? How many different ways? Our friend ways? Arif apparently says that's, a, that's like a common psychological question. Okay. Testing intelligence or something right. like that. So those ones I understand. Yeah. The, if there's reasoning behind it. Listen. The nut thing? Here's the thing. I don't mean, I don't want to be harsh on teams that, that run the grit test. You if do. there have been, I'm all about quantifying things. If there's a study, if Richard Sherman was like awesome at the grit test and then Earl Thomas was and then Bobby Wagner was and there's like a connection, if there's a correlation between the grit test and future on-field success, I am all for it. Anything that's going to help our evaluations. First of all, it would save us a ton of time. We don't have to grade any more snaps. We'll save a lot of money as a company. We'll get some. We'll fly out to all these prospects with that newfound money that we have. Do a ten to fifteen second grit test, and then boom, there's our evaluation. Could if you, it works, I'm all for it. Could you do a grit test like over Skype, FaceTime? 
Oh, that's even better. You need to be like, We'd save so much money. Right. You just dial them up. So you, this is why you're in management now. Right. Learning how to so save you don't need money. To, you don't need to waste all that money flying. You just FaceTime them. You spend like $1.50 for a Skype call. Right. Skype grit test. But then you can't really read them. That's probably good enough. It gets you 80% of the way there. Yeah. Hey, look, if the grit test works, I'm all for it. You did a pretty quick 180 on that. Yeah, maybe. I'm just trying to talk myself into it. Uh, it's so absurd. See, this right here is why you didn't get the Bengals job. Grit test, go. No. This right here is why you didn't get the Bengals job, because you had all these convictions and this plan, and then the second one random thing came out of you, are like, ah, maybe not. Listen, I chalked it up to a learning experience. We're still learning. My God. The Bengals could obviously sense your lack of conviction in your own. I'll be back. I'll be back. They're right down the road. They're, they haven't heard the last from me. Yeah. They have not heard the last from me. So Chris rolls into the office the other day, and uh, he said he was kind of, I don't want to say what he was doing. I don't want to call him out, but he was kind of skipping around on the podcast a little bit. So we fast forwarded to the part where I was talking about how it was a good experience and all that stuff, and he, for a split second, our boss, Big Chris, our boss, uh -huh. he thought that I had really gone through. <laughs> With this whole thing, which makes me think, I mean, I could, I might be able to fool him, you know? Yeah. Contract, you know, the clock's ticking. I don't think that's your problem. Is, clock's ticking. Is you need to somehow fool Neil. Into no, no, I'm going to go above Neil to the big boss. I'll just lay out all these um, opportunities that I've had. Did you show him the picture of you at the combine with the, the position coach interviews? Like we, could, we could stitch together a pretty convincing charade oh, here. I mean, that was, charade here. that was a good tweet. I appreciate you helping my... Uh, my push there. Yeah. I, there, was a, there was a sign. This is where the position interviews are. Didn't matter which one. You were just, you were going to take whatever was, was there. I was there to interview. Right. I was there to interview. Anyway, you got to go to the combine for the first time in a couple of years. You have a fun little experience before you had to, I know you yeah, had to go. Yeah, curtailed a little bit. A little bit. Uh, Sam had to leave a little early for off the field reasons. <laughs> but. Um, Medical threw something up. That uh, was sent home. You and Reuben Foster. Yeah. Sent home early. Well, it's I a red mean. flag. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an impatient man. You know, you're sitting there waiting all day with the medicals. You're just going to, you know, you're going to lose your patience sometimes. That's all I'm saying. This is why people don't like you. You got the temper. I don't, I mean, not unnecessarily. It's just sometimes, you know, sometimes you get, sometimes it's right to be angry pissed man. off at things. You're an angry man. All right, what, let's, let's get into the podcast. Hopefully people didn't fast forward through that thing. God, I'd be amazed Maybe if they anybody's still listening. Is anybody still listening? No. No. Now that everybody's gone. Yeah. Uh, shout out to my buddy Mike, though. He's listening. Yeah. He's on a long trip. He said, I need a good podcast to listen to. I said, I got one for you. I mean, I don't have a good one, but. I, I got, got eight podcasts <laughs> for you. I got, something, NFL podcast. I got something you can listen to. We got 12 minutes of grit test and uh, <laughs> Sam being sent home early from the combine. Anyway, combine stuff happened. Yeah. Uh, the eternal debate around here at the office. What does it mean? What do we do with all this stuff? We're a data-driven company. Our grades are all based off of pure on-field production. You know, at the heart of it, this is what we believe in, right? That on-field production is going to be the biggest indicator at the next level. I still look at it. I still look at it a little bit like uh, class, you know, college class, right? A college class, you might have three exams that make up ninety percent of your grade, and then ten percent is like class participation or just attendance or something like that. It's only ten percent, but you still want to do well at that ten percent. I, there's that's where I, th I think it all the all the stuff on the side the athleticism the interviews might hold more weight than we know just because guys are all over the spectrum as far as you know how crazy they are and how you know dedicated they are all that type of stuff but where do you where do you think the athleticism stuff that whole component comes into play here when we're talking about production and on field and what a guy's going to do versus how well they work out I think there's probably a few things affecting everything like None of this, nobody is getting drafted 100% because they ran a 4-3, right? So that part of things is just kind of silly. I think what the combine probably can do is apply a very real threshold of athleticism, which you need to clear in order to be taken seriously as a prospect, right? So PFF is grading college players against college players, and you could potentially be a phenomenal college player who just doesn't have the required athleticism to make a jump up to the NFL where players are bigger, stronger, and faster. And I think we can probably figure out down the line where that line is. So we can say, okay, this guy's got amazing PFF grades, but he runs slower than Steve, so he's probably not you know, an NFL caliber linebacker anymore. 
I'm fast. Yeah. Um, and I think we'll figure out where those lines are for each different position. I think that's probably the easiest thing to do. Then I think at that point, there may be guys who get boosted up a little bit because they're special athletes, you know, guys who are just breaking the numbers and going off the charts, a Julio Jones style guy who was able to have, you know, his testing was insane, even though he did it with a broken foot. And now we're seeing at the NFL level, he is probably the freakiest wide receiver in the league. He is the closest thing to Randy Moss we currently have in terms of being completely uncoverable because he is such an athletic specimen. So I think at either ends of the scale, you get some stuff that's useful that can change some perceptions a little bit. Everything in the middle is probably more or less the same, and it shouldn't do anything other than kind of raise reasons to go back to the tape. You know, if a guy runs something dramatically different to what you thought he would, well, okay, why has that happened? Or if a guy, right. you know, if there's a number that stands out as weird, I think it should basically force you to go back and recheck things but it shouldn't be completely changing your evaluation of a guy. Yeah, so using that percentage breakdown that I'm saying, let's pretend production, 90% might be extreme, but production's the, the majority of what we're saying. There's a lot of people that are deconstructing things the other way and saying, okay, here's this baseline of Julio Jones type receivers and AJ Greens and Odell Beckhams or whoever the successful receivers are and saying, okay, they ran this and they're you know comparing their three cones and all this stuff. And they're trying to... Uh, you know, essentially reverse engineer good players in their combine numbers. Now, so you're almost starting from that point. Whereas we're gonna we're gonna reverse engineer good players versus their PFF college grades and use that as a starting point. So an example like Julio Jones, we didn't have PFF college grades for him. I assume he would have graded pretty well. Um, let's who, Miles Garrett, guy that graded well. I, last week when I interviewed Lance Erline, I brought up Miles Garrett versus Rashawn Gary. If you're doing this from a production standpoint, you'd put Miles Garrett and Rashawn Gary together. Garrett's way up here and Gar Gary's low. Garrett's good, Gary's low. And then you compare their measurables and they're the same, right? So if you're starting with measurables, you're like, oh, they're in the same tier. And you'd almost expect the same thing. And then maybe use the tape as a tiebreaker where we're going to use the tape, which we've quantified, our quantified film analysis, which we believe to be very, very good. We use that to start. And then it's like, oh, by the way, they're the same level of athlete. So I think we just come at it from a different way. Is that the right? I, I think that we think that's the right way to do it. Other people do it kind of backwards. Well, is I that think, a fair way, to, fair way of laying it out? I mean, I think the bottom line is we're going to be using data scientists to actually look at all this stuff, grades, athleticism, whatever it is, and find out what the stuff is that matters. Right. Right? And we've just scratched the surface on that initial run is – Negligible, negligible impact across the board. Right. But when, I think it's about tidying up some of those outliers. And when you look at know. everything, there's nothing that is a tighter correlation of how a guy is going to do in the NFL to how he's done in college from right. a production standpoint. Right. So just the initial run of that stuff, that should be your starting point because it has the highest correlation to anything. Now, obviously, there'll be other things that affect it, say athleticism, you know, whatever. But that appears to be a much sounder foundation to base things on than athleticism. It's just a higher, a tighter correlation, a more clear indicator of how a guy's going to do. So let's use examples of what happened at the combine. There's, I think, three big ones. DK Metcalf, the wide receiver from Ole Miss. There's Montez Sweat, the edge defender from Mississippi State. And then Michigan, just call him a defensive lineman because he could play on the edge or in the defensive interior, Rashawn Gary. These are three guys that we've actually all put that we've already put as overrated type players. Guys that are getting top 10, top 15 type of hype that had less than stellar PFF grades. To be fair, Montez Sweat had solid, just good grades across the board. Um, and I think our narrative on him will kind of be similar to Bradley Chubb last year, but yeah. we liked Chubb a little bit better as a player. So good grades for Sweat, very questionable grades for Rashawn Gary, and then kind of in the middle with uh, questionable grades for DK Metcalf, let's be fair. Metcalf runs a 4-3-3. Let's start with him. 4-3-3 at 233 pounds with some of the worst change of direction metrics we've ever seen for a wide receiver. What do we do with that? Well, this is the fast... He, I mean, he, I think, had the most fascinating combine of anybody. Certainly this year, maybe ever. We are talking about a guy who was already... People were losing their minds over him before the combine. You know, these pictures emerging of him looking shredded and looking like Superman... 
um, you know, standing there shirtless in his workout facility, just looking ridiculous, right? Then it comes out that in the initial sort of body measurement stuff, he apparently has a 1.6% body fat rate, which is basically impossible. And to the point where NFL teams were questioning, like, what? That, what? And everyone was saying, well, that's the number that came right out of the body pod machine, which is supposedly the most accurate way of measuring these things. Now, I had a bunch of people on my Twitter timeline, guys with PhDs in, you know, human um, physiology and, and that kind of thing. Are you name dropping your Twitter followers? I mean, I would if I remembered his name, but at the moment, I just remember oh. there was a guy with a PhD in human physiology who was basically saying, yeah, anything under 3%, you're dying. Like, your body needs subcutaneous fat to function it feels like to a repair itself. Okay. Right. So he says, one, there's a way bigger chance that the body pod screwed it up than he's actually at 1.6%. And two, if he was at 1.6%, it would be a way bigger problem than it would be a laudable quality. Right. Like, it's not, we shouldn't be celebrating that going, wow, look at this shredded guy. That's incredible. So it's a red flag. Yeah. You should be saying, if he's 1.6%, that's a medical issue we need to fix. Um, so you've got that. Then you have this guy, monstrous, huge runs 4-3, jumps out of the gym, 40-plus vertical, uh, 27 bench press reps, which is a ridiculous number. All these numbers, the broad jump was good. These are all incredible stats. But then teamed with a three-cone and a short shuttle time that weren't just bad, but they were slower than Tom Brady. Now, Well, Tom's mobile in the pocket. Tom's good footwork. Tom Brady's combine workout went down in folklore as one of the most depressing examples of biomechanical ineptitude that humanity has ever seen. It's in a straight line. Like, maneuvers the pocket. He was it's this... Not fair. It's hard when you're, this, when you're DK and you're going so fast. It's tough to throttle down. This stork with lack of... with complete absence of definition loping his way around Indianapolis back in the day. And apparently did that quicker than DK Metcalf did whenever it came to changing directions. Like, that isn't just... Maybe that means DK is going to be the best of all time, too. As a quarterback? That isn't just strange. It's like, I need an explanation to that. That's weird to the point of that doesn't even make sense. Like, there's no way you should be able to move 4-3 in that direction over 40 and not be able to change direction faster than Tom Brady. And, and we're on here... Every week, you'll you'll say it. Mike Renner will say it. The most important thing in today's NFL is the ability to get open and separate. Right. So now we have DK Metcalf, who on film doesn't look like he's not the sharpest route runner anyway. The numbers don't really back up that he's the sharpest route runner. Um, but, you know, our guy Zach Robinson helped with our wide receiver evaluations before getting hired by the Los Angeles Rams. He starts his job today. Good luck. Break a leg, Zach, over in, uh, with the Rams. But he liked Metcalf. As, yeah. as the top wide receiver. Like, we'd like him as a, as a wide receiver, as a first-round wide receiver. I think you have to be realistic about what you're getting, though. I don't think you're getting Julio Jones. I've seen Mike Evans comparisons. I mean, Mike Evans dominated at Texas A&M yeah. and has carried over that contested catchability and his ability to really take over games with the Bucs. I like my Martavis Bryant comparison. Martavis Bryant, at his best, before all the off-field stuff, deep threat, He's going to get behind the defense once or twice a game, which is significant. That's huge. He'll drop one of those passes. He dropped a few Big Ben dimes when he was there. But the defense has to take care. It has to worry about him. And if you have a compliment on the other side, it doesn't have to be as good as Antonio Brown, but you have a high-volume option on the other side. You have Martavis being a deep threat. Like, he'd be great opposite DeAndre Hopkins. I know they already have Will Fuller. You know, opposite a guy that could be the high-volume possession type of guy, I think Bryant has a ton of value in the league. I just worry. I don't think he's a 120, 140 target type of guy that you're just going to feed at all levels of the field. Can I give you a potential comp sure. for DK Metcalf? I was trying to, I was just, as you were talking there, Steve, I don't like to listen to you much. So I was you, in my own head. Wheels are turning. Right. Thinking of, uh, thinking of potential comps for him. I don't know why people think we don't like each no, other. No, it's, it's, it's hard to believe. Um, the thing is, if you watch his tape plus all these numbers, the thing that jumps out is he his game is all about basically physically destroying opposition. Like there's a, there's a play that people like to pull out against Alabama Thanks, that where somebody tried to press him at the line of scrimmage 
and his thing is all about he win he defeats press not by most people defeat press coverage by a bit of quickness at the line you know quickly swipe the hands and then get going right he took his arm basically clubbed the guy out of the way and then ran clean past him right he just physically abuses people which reminds me of a couple of people one brandon marshall remember when brandon marshall right at the end of his career with the jets went to play the seahawks and him and richard sherman just had this war like a physical war for the entire game he won a few times got open um brandon marshall i don't think ever had the straight line speed that metcalf apparently has but that physicality reminds me of the same thing the other guy who i think the same thing is true for is terrell owens now obviously Mm -hmm. t.o is you know like a hall of fame caliber receiver so that's setting the bar pretty high but a physical specimen right but from a stylistic point of view T.O. was a guy who physically dominated cornerbacks. He was huge. He was fast. He was jacked. You look at the guy now. He's in his 40s. He's still got a six-pack. Looks like he could still go out there and play. Like, Metcalf wins by being physically way more intimidating than you are. And that's probably going to continue. Well, yeah, he's way more jacked than I am. I'm just... Well, definitely you. But I'm thinking more NFL cornerbacks. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a monster. So... You okay with us putting him in the first round as wide receiver one? I mean, I think so. Look, is this like is this like a true upside situation? Is this yeah the ones I mean, that we don't love? But. The change of direction thing is concerning and strange to the point of needing an explanation, right? But let's say it's legit and it holds up. What you have to ask yourself is, will that physical dominance continue at the next level? And I think the more you do this and the longer you look at these guys, guys that are off the charts in terms of some form of physical dominance – that doesn't go away at the next level. You know, you look at these guys and say, well, that's not going to continue in the NFL where guys are bigger, stronger, faster. But if you're like off the end of the scale, it does. Like you still, he's 230 pounds, grown a 4-3. Most NFL cornerbacks, even in this age of bigger corners, are 200. They're, they're giving up 30 pounds to him. They can't run a 4-3. So he's still going to be physically dominant. Yeah, so that's the whole thing. When we talk about ceilings and floors, which I think are tough to define, trying to define his floor is it he's at least a deep throw. He's at least a guy that the defense has to account for that I think can win against press for various reasons, like you said, and get behind the defense. So even if he catches 40 passes a year at 18 a pop, I mean, it's not really what you want from a first-round player, but it, but there's value there. Yeah. If you have the complimentary pieces around him. So that's DK Metcalf. Um, if you call him a winner at the Combine, I don't know if that's fair to call him a straight winner at the Combine. When you look at the change of direction and all that stuff, I mean, it was kind of, don't uh, you say double, don't double count this whole thing. He looks fast on, ta- on tape. He looks big and physical on tape. He showed it at the Combine. If anything, the change of direction is way more concerning than anything because how can he be the true number one wide receiver i don't know if he can it's so strange because you know there's that website mockdraftable.com that shows these sort of spider charts of of everybody and essentially the idea is how many i don't know how many segments that is but if you're if your spider chart is like a circle you're high out towards the edges you're basically perfect at everything the analytics people are very oh they hate the spider charts but it's interesting it's pac-man right when you look at his it's like a circle everywhere except change of direction, which Pac-Man. is like a giant hole in his... That's your change of direction. ...in his profile. So you look at this guy who is essentially the perfect wide receiver prospect from a measurable standpoint, and then it all collapses in for change of direction. It's right to the middle. It doesn't just, like, dip. It vanishes. I, so I think that is completely... Un- I can't think of a player who compares to that a guy who was so good at everything else except one specific thing they were among the worst you're ever going to see at it the cornerback version the closest thing to the cornerback version for us is maybe trey waynes right but he doesn't have the physical dominance all we said about waynes was his shuttle time was worse than his 40 time which had happened like seven times in the last 10 years for corners so he was a good vertical he's good at recovering vertical routes and even trey waynes three cone was in the 19th percentile not the third not or whatever. Third. Right. He was the second in the three. Second percentile three cone. Third percentile 20 yard shuttle. Again, special thanks to Mock Draftable right. who puts a lot of this stuff together. Nice, easy uh, way to just... Whereas you know, Trey Waynes, who was a guy whose change of direction was concerning, was in the 19th percentile in three cone. 
and didn't have the same vertical, the same broad jump. He was right there at the 40, um, not the 10-yard split either. So again, it's just not, he doesn't have the same dominance in all the other things that Metcalf had, and his hole in his thing was worse. So I, I, I legitimately think that Metcalf's kind of profile coming out of the combine is completely and totally unprecedented, and therefore I have no idea what to do with it. Great. Do what I said. He's Martavis Bryant. Move on. To the defensive lineman. Montez Sweat runs a 4-4-1 at 6-6-260. 6-5 and a quarter. 260. 6-5 and three quarters. How about that? Okay. 260. You need that specificity. And then Rashawn Gary. Rashawn Gary, we completely expected. We've talked about him quite a bit as an overrated type of prospect. Again, Sweat graded good, not great. Gary was even below that. Two guys who were getting top 10 hype, and we said... I don't know. I mean, if anything, sweat, this moves the needle for me on sweat more than it moves the needle on Gary because sweat is a guy who seems like he just tries to win with length. And if anything, the fact that he is an incredible athlete, forget the 4-4-1, everything else was really good too, makes me think, okay, if, if he's going to learn something and be able to be, you know, improve a little bit, the tools are there. Gary's just so much further down on the production chart, then it's really tough. Well, Gary's is the one where nothing changed right he, he did right, the what expectation you expected, right he was a guy who's had middling pr- uh, production in college regardless of numbers um and was we knew would be a spec a spectacular athlete and he was a spectacular athlete so you're left with exactly the same situation as you were heading into the combine sweat though is a guy who i think had a better day than people expected so he now you come at him and you say well okay now we have something to do because why was his production not spectacular? It was good, not great, but why did he not dominate the way you would expect a guy with that measurable profile to dominate? So this is where I, I think I want to change all the questions because we always, we always think about the future and looking forward and everybody likes to assume that players are going to get better. So you get him with the right defensive line coach, you get him in the right system, he'll just get better. He's young, he'll get better. You, you hate the age thing, right? Because mm-hmm. you just... What they are is what they are to a point, right? So should the question be what I posed yesterday? I said, you know, when Rashawn Gary runs great, instead of saying, man, let's compare him to all these other guys that have looked like that and played well at the NFL level. He looks like Vaughn and he looks like Miles Garrett and he looks like whoever, Joey Bosa. Instead say, with this level of athleticism, why are we getting subpar NFL, uh, college production? From a team at Michigan that in our grading system has churned out right. highly graded guys on the interior and on the edge. Now, I had a very insightful conversation with somebody when I tweeted that out yesterday. It was, it was a guy looking at it through the proper lens. He said, look, Michigan scheme, he's playing strong side defensive end. They're trying to set up all sorts of stunts and blitzes. And there's, it's true to a point. And he said, look, he graded, he played the same position Chris Warmly played a couple years ago of the Ravens, right? Warmly? Is he with the Ravens? Warmly. I get all, ugh, there was so many Michigan. Now I just screwed up. Where did he end up? I forget where he went. Um, the other guy went to, there's so many Michigan guys, and one of them went to um, to the Ravens. Warmly, though, gr- posted better grades than Gary ever had. No, you're right. He went to the it Ravens. It was the Ravens. Okay. So he posted better grades than Gary's ever posted. Yeah. And then there is truth to what this guy said. I mean, you see that scheme in Michigan, and they are trying to do all sorts of different things with stunts and all that. So I said, okay, let me go to trusty PFF Ultimate here because we've built this massive filtering system where I just have to click a few buttons and I said, I'm going to take off play action. Take play action out of the equation. State straight, state straight drop back passing. Get that? Class of 2019, all edge defenders, no blitzes, no stunts, and just third and fourth down. Let me scroll down and find your... Say, Take a couple minutes to uh, buy some time while I scroll down to Rashawn Gary's grade. Yeah. Um, one of the things that Gary said heading into the combine, you know, every guy has these sound bites before they roll in, and he was like, it's I'm not, the number the one player. 50. I'm the number one player in the entire draft. He wasn't even the number one player. He wasn't even the number one edge rusher on Michigan. Nope. Like That's Chase. That's quite a long way from being the number one player in the entire draft. You may be as good an athlete as anybody or have the potential which is that word that gets everybody into trouble. But you were a worse college player than Winovich was. And it just turns out he's not a terrible athlete. And even so if you, even if you account for 
Winovich gets the the open side. He gets right. the you know the freer rush and all that stuff. It's still significant. Yeah. Have I, have I found Rashawn Gary? Are you still going? Do I need Got to it. kill more time? Filtered by at least twenty five opportunities in this situation. Over the last three years, this is a multi year sample, Sam. Okay. So in this situation, no blitz, no stunts, third and fourth down, rushing the passer. Rashawn Gary's number seventy seven, tied for seventy seventh in the draft class among edge defenders. Now it's seventy five rushes, and most guys are in that various sample. Um, seventy five rushes, and he's got thirteen total pressures, which isn't bad overall. But the grade accounts for you know the speed of pressure and all that stuff. Four of those pressures are cleanup pressures. That's not dominant, right? Again, going back to our grades, the D line stuff is our best stuff. It's the it's the easiest it, the, the best that uh, that translates at the next level. It doesn't mean that Gary can't hit. That it just means his odds are far lower than maybe people think. It's re- it's interesting because the obviously Mike Mayock is now the Oakland Raiders GM, personnel guy over there. Yep. So the new Mike Mayock was Daniel Jeremiah in on NFL Network coverage, sitting there with Rich Eisen throughout the weekend of of the combine, and everybody's been talking up Jeremiah's how doing a fantastic job. And what was really interesting is I think he gave the the, the best. Um, window into the mind of traditional NFL thinking of anybody. You know, Mike's always, Mike Mayock has always come at this kind of from his own angle. You know, he's been on the outside basically just doing the personnel work himself and has now come into the NFL. Jeremiah came from scouting. And so he, he understands how these guys work. He was talking at one point about how he used to have to give a face grade on a guy. It wasn't something he was proud of, but a team that he worked for made them give a face grade on every single guy. Exactly the, the money ball joke, like the thing they mocked people for. He used to have to do that. So at one point when Gary had the great time, when Sweat did his measurables, he was asked to compare the two, you know? And he was saying that Gary can just do more. He can, because of his size and his, the girth and the sort of the, the ability that he has, he can do things that these other guys can't, which is exactly the way these NFL guys think. It's what can you do? And that's what we're going to project forward because now you're going to be in an NFL program. You're going to have one-on-one coaching. You're going to have a nutrition program, a weight room dedicated all times. You've got nothing else to worry about. So of course you're going to reach the, realize this potential. And w- what we do is we look at it and we say, well, okay, maybe. It's possible, right? Things are going to be different because you're not going to have to worry about all the other things. But if, if a guy hasn't, the question is not how, what can you do? It's how often do you do it and what happens between those plays where you can do it? it it's also trying to find people who are similar, right? People who are similar in the ways that matter. So if we say that grade matters, find all the other people that grade it in a similar manner to Gary and just say, okay, in a vacuum, you don't, without even watching tape, what's the percentage that these guys hit? Right. And then maybe you, then you add the pieces to the puzzle. Okay, there were some outliers here and there. What were the consistencies in the outliers? But either way, they were outliers. And my data people, our friends, our data scientist friends, keep telling us, don't focus on the outliers. So when we go back and look at PFF pass rush grades for edges, Danell Hunter is a clear outlier. You know he's with the Vikings. He's been a you know, he's had a ton, he's been a sack artist. Even Sam, he's got a ton of sacks. He's got a good, not great NFL pass rush grade despite the sack, seventy one point three. Didn't have a great pass rush grade in college. There was a bit of an explanation for it. I think they played a lot of contain at LSU. The same thing. We're trying to make excuses for Gary. I think there was something to that with Hunter. He was a very good run defender. Either way, he's exceeded expectations. If we go into this completely focused on like, man, we missed on Donnell Hunter. He had great measurables and didn't have great production. We missed on him. Now we're going to go to bat for Gary. Then we're not, we're not playing the odds properly. And that's, what, and that's all this whole thing is, is playing the odds. So you're talking about the NFL. If the NFL is viewing it through the lens of, the last time I got a guy like this, it worked out or it didn't work out, and you're just viewing it through your own little lens, you're working with a small sample size. Yeah, but I think Gary is the perfect example of a guy who is 100% a can-do player. 
I mean, again, you look at the... It's like Cam Robinson a couple of years ago. You put on the tape, you immediately see... Oh, the best why, plays are incredible. Right, why yeah. people love him. He can do anything you want him to do. The question is, how often does he do it? And it, the answer for those guys in particular was always not often enough. And, the, and Lance Erline in our interview last week specifically said that. He's actually saying, I'm looking for the can-do guys. And then he said, you know, he'll go back and interview and talk to a defensive line coach or say, and, and say, can these things improve? Again, which is fine, we take a different approach and we say, whether they can or not, what is the percentage that they have? And even if I don't, even if I don't talk to a D-line coach, just what are the odds that that's going to hit? If I do talk to a D-line coach, we've run into more trouble doing that, and we've talked about that on this podcast here, talking to O-line coaches, D-line coaches, where they're good at saying, this guy's good. I could tell this guy's good. This guy needs work, and here's how I could fix him. That's where coaches get into trouble. Yeah. So I don't know if I trust any coach, even the best coaches in the world. Maybe Dante Scarnecchia, great offensive line coach. Maybe I trust him more than others, but there's still some risk there. Yeah. You know, and that's all it is. This is the whole thing's like risk management. And so, I mean, being, sorry, able, being able to identify, Sean. being able to identify specific mechanical or technique things that guys are doing wrong, which is why they're not dominating every single play is one thing. Being able to change those specific mechanical or technique issues that are causing that is a completely different thing. So, you know, Mike Leach just did this big thing at the Combine about how you can't fix a guy's accuracy past the age of like 14. Once he's past 14, 15, it's in, it's set. You're not going to, no matter what issue you can identify from a, a mechanical or technique standpoint, you're not going to fix it. It's in his, it's muscle memory at that point. It's not changing. I think the same thing is true with, with most of these things that, you're probably not going to fundamentally rebuild a guy's mechanics to the point where it's no longer a problem. So just because you can see what it is, just because you can identify the issue does not mean you can fix it. Um, I've lived that, by the way. I mean, I tried to revamp my throwing mechanics in my 20s. I got marginally better. I definitely got better. Right. But it's also the how much does it need to get better. That's, that's the big issue, too. Because... If you're going to pick Rashawn Gary in the top 10, you don't want him to get a little bit better. You need him to be a Vaughn Miller, Khalil Mack. I mean, you want him to be an elite pass rusher. I don't know if that's going to happen. I resorted the numbers. I took him, I took out third and fourth down. So now it's all pass rushes. No blitz, no stunts. Now we have 209 rushes for Gary over the last three years. In the draft class alone, he's tied for 50th among edge rushers. In the draft class, in these pass first situation 69.7 pff grade where's uh winovich winovich in the other and when we did third and fourth down was fourth hmm. now he's ninth okay in the names at the top we have josh allen kentucky ron heen bingham one of our mid-round sleepers from uh, arkansas state this is just using pff grade again taking all that context of speed of win and how easy it was all that stuff malik reed from nevada another mid-round sleeper type nick bosa the guy that we think is the best player in the draft anthony nelson from iowa wins with power quite a bit uh, sutton smith from northern illinois has crushed our system the question for him is size right. is he really a linebacker at the next level similar uh guy here o'shane zimenez from old dominion little undersized edge rusher what do you do with him at the next level because those guys it's tough to play at that size at the next level Ja'Kai Polite from Florida, who just had a terrible combine from a workout and interview standpoint, but his grades have been good in those situations. Then Chase Winovich and Zach Allen from Boston College. So all of those names that I mentioned, there's some, some there are fellow first-round candidates. Yeah. Rashawn Gary's fellow first-round candidates up in that mix. Then you have Brian Burns from Florida State. He's at 13. Joe Jackson from Miami at 14. There's The bigger names are at the top. Are, yeah. Right? So again, can Gary hit? Yes. But he's low. I'll, do, I'll try to do a YouTube video breaking down some of this stuff, too. Right, but ultimately, you, you have to be asking yourself the question, why? Why was he not as good as we think he should have been based off what we're seeing? You can't possibly come out of that looking at his, his athletic profile and saying, well, he's obviously going to be better at the next level. You need to ask, why was he not better at the college level? Let me do a live study, if I can get this thing to work a live efficiently. Study. A live study. Because I, I glanced at this the other day. So Lance mentioned in his interview, I, I brought up Ed Oliver. You know, these are the guys that we said, look, with all of this skill that we can see, this talent that we could see on tape, why, why are the production numbers not better? Oliver is a guy we said should have rushed the passer better yeah. in the American conference, right? He should have. Yes. And, and we've said this, and then Lance has 
said Lance said, well, he's you know he's playing zero tech. That's the nose tackle straight up on the center. Easy double team opportunities. So again, it's easy for us to look through our system and say, okay, let's, let's check fil- it out. Let's filter those out. And this actually does point to, yes, there's some truth to that. His pass rush grade took a big hit when he had to play straight up nose, and he was much better when he was more of a traditional defensive tackle. So now we can sit back and say, okay, are, have we been too harsh on him? Do we have to adjust for that a little bit? Now, Oliver was already in the first round mix for us anyway, uh, but it is it is easy to move. Are easy, the question now, top 10 versus top 20 is a fair one as we deconstruct his pass rush grade. Since you're juggling all this information live, can you do the flip side of that equation and say, what is his grade when you take away those nose tackle plays. That's, so that's what I, I did both. Um, Where did that land up? They both, I think they both were pretty good. I have to redo this. I, I did want to do this on the board for YouTube. Because we'll the interesting thing about Oliver is, sure, rushing from nose tackle is not exactly the easiest place to rush from. You know, there's a reason that three technique was created essentially as a defensive alignment. It's because those guys are designed to get one-on-one against a guard in a little bit of space. Right. Get the nose tackle is the guy that's going to have some problems because he's got an easy double team opportunity. There's a center right over him, plus a guard can come in to double team him. But that's where a guy like Trey Flowers was killing people in the NFL. The Patriots would move him inside, line him up a a true nose tackle, and his speed as an edge rusher would be able to knife into one of those A gaps and completely destroy those interior players. We've seen Ed Oliver has that freaky level of quickness and, you know, maneuverability. I would still expect him to be able to rush the passer well, even from a no tackle alignment. See if we can get it to load. But he had a he had a solid. Here's the thing: he had a solid pass rush grade this year anyway, because he had a lot of quick wins that didn't turn into pressures. He didn't right. have a ton of pressures, but that was part of it too. He'd have a quick win, maybe a guard picks him up because of the double team. It wasn't necessarily translating. Uh, two actual pressures. So less than half the total pressures of Quinn and Williams on, well, significantly fewer pass rush snaps, but still. So as a straight nose tackle in the draft class, number thirteen as a pass rusher. Okay. Um, which isn't, and it was right by Christian Wilkins. It's right actually above Jeffrey Simmons, who we like better. And the samples are small on a lot of this stuff. Like Quinn and Williams is number five. Dexter Lawrence is number one. Um, but Ed Oliver has 182 snaps there. That's the most in the draft class by so far. So what happens when we weed those out? So now... The flip side. If I go ahead and undo... This is just live PFF I, ultimating. This is magic right here. It is. This is what this podcast... This is great it's radio. It's a shame nobody right? can see it. Well, that's why I'm going to do a YouTube video. Yeah. For those Showing people, it would be exactly. great. For the people stuck listening to us right now, it's perhaps a little bit lacking. This is good podcasting. We're because we're, we're explaining our, pro, uh, yeah. pro, our process, Sam. It's perhaps we're also buying time a little right bit of now. Magic, but yeah, we're showing the process as best we can. Uh-huh. Let this thing load. It's a lot of positions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, uh, we're to load. It. Um, but but look, I, I think this is important. We posted a video last week of uh, Mike Renner and I in the boardroom, so to speak, in the draft room, going through putting together our top ten. We're gonna have more of those coming out. We got a lot of good feedback on those because. We are trying to explain our process as much as possible, you know? Yeah. I mean, so Ed Oliver was another one of the combine winners, if you like, purely because he showed up and weighed 280 plus, 287 pounds. Just, which is just by showing up. Heavier than Aaron Donald. It is. Whereas people unexpected. thought that he would be another 5, 10 pounds under Aaron Donald. People were talking 270 something and asking him to run linebacker drills. Right. Shows up at 287. That puts him in Aaron Donald, Geno Atkins range. Suddenly you're talking about prototypical 2019 NFL three technique again. I got some numbers for you. Yes. So that was, a big, that was a big win. And now that we dive into this further, he's number three. Ooh. Non-nose tackle pass rushes. Here's the number. This is, this is also a three-year sample, by the way. What did I say? At 190 or so? 180, I think you said. 187, 180, whatever. Nose tackle snaps. Only 165 non-nose tackle pass rushes. Um, this also has the blitz and stunt filter. Okay. Off. Okay, so I've taken, I'm trying to get those pure pass rush right. situations. Now he's number three in the class with Quinn and Williams, number one. He's okay. number one at everything. Right. Armand Watts from Arkansas, only 78 attempts here. And then Ed Oliver. Ed is ahead of Christian Wilkins, Jerry Tillery, Draymond Jones, and Jeffrey Simmons. Those are all guys that we've put a, slapped a, a pure first-round grade on. Right, now we're talking. So now 
live on the podcast, we're deconstructing Ed Oliver's evaluation, and I'm ready to move him up right. the horizontal Sh- board a little shooting bit. Shooting him up the draft board. Right, just by, just by studying him a little bit using our database. So I think that's fair. So this is how we use the PFF grade. This is why when the draft guide comes out, this week as part of PFF Edge and Elite. You guys need it because you need all this information and there's all these different data points in there where you guys, you can't go through our whole database like I'm doing right now, but you right. guys can deconstruct, oh, he, he won to the outside, he won with bull rushes. You can get more information about a player. And this is, by the way, why our grading is used and is way more important to NFL teams than detractors like to acknowledge, you know? People say, well, the PFF grade isn't the be-all and end-all. And it's true. The overall number is not just something to take and roll with and have no other context to. But what the grading does allow you to do is to start doing things like this, where you say, okay, in this situation, with these circumstances applied, what does the grade look like? Right. And that way, you can start to pull out things like, well, okay, Ed Oliver didn't have as much pass rush production as you would expect, but if you start pulling out these things, actually, suddenly it jumps up. And it looks way better. So you don't just look at his overall grade and say, well, really elite run defender, not so great as a pass rusher, even though it looks like he should be. Forget it. You can actually tease that out further using the grading. And that's why NFL teams, the grading is still valuable to them, even if you can't see the obvious connection because you're just looking at overall number versus a player and saying, well, that doesn't add up. And and I will say the feedback we get, we get a ton of feedback every year at the Combine. There's still different levels of usage but we get more and more feedback about how teams are using the grades and the teams that are using it properly, you can you can tell right. when they're using it properly. Um, not to pick, pick on Rashawn Gary again, but the other part about this situation is, you know, we've heard reports about Ed Oliver not, you know, I'm not picking on the Houston coaching staff, but there wasn't a lot of change there. There wasn't a lot of keeping it uh, fresh for him on a day-to-day basis. Th- that's part of the reason why there may not have been as much development as expected. Rashawn Gary's up at Michigan again with this pretty good, you know, output of defensive linemen, at least from a college production standpoint. You know, so that's the other thing. Is Ed Oliver going to have NFL coaching and take to it even more? You know, there's something there's something there. So um, we're willing to dig into these evaluations. Ed Oliver and Christian Wilkins, they're back to back on this list here. Both came into the season, I think, with less than stellar PFF pass rush grades, very good run defense grades. And we said, look, if you could rush the passer a little bit better, then you guys are top 15, top 20 prospects. And when given the opportunity, they've both stepped up and shown that they can do it. And I think that that helps their evaluation. And that's where we are. Man. So I had fun with that. I don't know if anybody else did. Sorry, right. Nobody was listening after the, uh, the grid test anyway. You think? Yeah. Grid test, go. No. <sighs> It's going to trick you into it. No. But maybe that's that's you winning. Yeah. They want you to just say, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. Tell your Quentin Nelson stories. There were two of them. They were both on NFL Network's broadcast. Um, the first one was apparently in his interview with the 49ers. There was this famous play that always sort of came up with Quentin Nelson's tape where he's obviously left guard. He He's basically got nothing to do on a drop back. Everyone's fanned out for pass protection. A safety from the other side of the formation is coming down unblocked. Nelson sees it coming, comes across the formation, takes him out of the play. Quarterback lives to fight another day. And the 49ers sat down. They said, how did you talk us through this? How did you know that was coming? How did you figure out that this was going to happen? How did you make that play, essentially? And he basically sat there and said, I mean, you know, I watched tape. I recognized the formation. I saw it coming. I took out the safety. Then apparently looks at John Lynch, the 49ers GM, and said, and I've done the same thing if it was you. I love it. So that's pretty ballsy. Um, the other story was... How did they not pick him? Oh, they didn't have a chance know. to. The other thing was uh, apparently one team, like, there was some drill that he wasn't doing or he maybe didn't run the 40 or whatever it was. And they said, look, if you're not doing this, we're, we're not going to be picking you. And he said, look, all I do is bury people into the dirt every single play. If you can't work that out from the tape, then I can't help you. So that one in particular good answer. is my favorite uh, Quentin Nelson story. The John Lynch thing is good, but that's, that's pretty special. Man, those interviews. I'd love to be a fly on the wall in these ridiculous interviews. Yeah, some of them. Some of them. The grit test one in particular. I would, they were talking about uh, Kyla Murray having an interview lined up with the Cardinals. I would pay good money to listen to that. Yeah, for sure. So let's, do, do you want to hit on some of the NFL rumors really quick? Can we do rapid fire? We're not good at rapid fire. No, we're not. 
Hang on. Well, let's just rapidly hit on the Kyler Murray thing. He's 5'10", so it's all good. Now he's the number one overall pick by consensus. Now he's good. Because he was half an inch taller than we thought he was going to be. I, I'm going to have... I want to sit in a room with George and Eric because they have, again, a very mathematical way of looking at this using wins above replacement and all that stuff. We're going to do a series this week where we sit in the draft room and just talk it out. Is Kyler Murray worth the number one pick? What would you do with Rosen? Is Kyler Murray that much more valuable than Rosen? Um, we can, you can be a part of the conversation if you want. But say, I think Have you noticed how quick you are to marginalize me for my own podcast? No, anytime, it's not the podcast. Any opportunity you get, it's all... It's a YouTube you, video. It's out of the, the room here, we'll get Renner in. But you could be and in. And it's, I want to talk to George and Eric. It's because people don't like you. Mm. You're just not likable. See, this, this is back to why people are going to think we hate each other, because you're being an asshole. Look, I'm just, I'm just, the YouTubers telling me. Uh-huh. I read the comments again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They like me now. Mm. How's that? That well, might you, be you bad You pander to them. That'll help. You're like, popular, Steve. Like a, like a politician. Yeah. Here. Like a politician. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're doing a good job not, you know, sitting like this. I've been working and, on that. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's not easy. It's the negative body language. Once you get rid of that, though, you're a likable guy. I like hanging around with you, Sam. Not you crossing fun. my arms is difficult. You're my, you're my buddy over the combine. We're hanging out. Um, but real quick, would you take Kyler Murray, number one? This is the hot question if you're the Cardinals. Yes. Do you move on from Rosen? Yes. Yeah. He's, I mean, all the data we're looking at right now says that he is not quite Baker Mayfield, but closer to Baker Mayfield than any other prospect we've seen in the past five years, at which point that is a significant upgrade from Josh Rosen, who at the very minimum is as good as he was a year ago, right? The last oh, year of the playing, same, right. same guy, same but evaluation. He certainly hasn't gone up. So the last year of his experience in the NFL is unlikely to have been a positive given how terrible it went, but it could have been a negative. So at the very minimum, Josh Rosen is the same guy he was a year ago, and Kyler Murray looks to be better than that. At which point, yeah, upgrade. Take the quarterback, deal Josh Rosen, and that should be a deal that you can make happen for a first-round pick because whoever takes him on doesn't have to pay the $12 million signing bonus. So you essentially have a discount first-round quarterback, albeit one who has a year less on his deal than you would have normally. The rumor to Washington? Perfect. If I'm Washington, I would, t- I would make that move. Yeah. Absolutely. You get a first-round quarterback who is, at least on paper, people are saying is probably better than anyone on the, in this class outside of maybe Kyler Murray. So you get to have essentially the second-best quarterback in this draft class. It costs you a first-round pick, but you don't need to pay him a signing bonus. Yeah, and all would, you've missed out is a year on the end of his contract. The Redskins at 15, the Dolphins at what, 13, the Broncos, if they hadn't traded for Joe Flacco at 10, yeah. I am in that market. And then you've got the Giants and the Jaguars and maybe the Cardinals I've seen this fighting one. over Kyler Murray, Dwayne Haskins. But if I'm in that next tier, I'm taking, I'm going after Rosen way before I go after Drew Locke, Daniel Jones, or any yeah. of the other guys. I've seen this one come up a bit. If you're the Patriots, would you trade 32 to get Josh Rosen and potentially Tom Brady's successor? Uh, given the draft capital that the New England Patriots have, I think that's worth the risk. And, and my whole thing with Rosen, we throw him on this Eli you know, type of level where the high ends are really high. You're going to have some lows, but it's a lot of it's just throwing, throwing darts, right? The quarterback deal. He's worth, right. the, he's worth the dart. He's worth That's the shot, what I'm saying. Right? He's worth the dart. If I'm, if I'm the Patriots, the saints don't have the draft capital, but if I'm those teams that need the successor, I'm all for giving it a shot. And because of what you're saying with the financial aspect of it, you're not necessarily tied to him and you just keep keep throwing throwing darts if the Patriots have Will Greer available and they want to take a shot at him maybe it's Tom Brady Josh Rosen and Will Greer all in the same room next year and you're just like all right Brady plays for another eight years let's see what these two guys have right during those eight years that's what's going to happen I like that I like that idea Um, it's just a fascinating time with quarterbacks though because Ryan Tannehill's still like an NFL caliber starter he's going to be on the market Uh, Teddy Bridgewater is going to be on the market Nick Foles right now is rumored to go to Jacksonville. They're going to cut Blake Bortles. The Patriots supposedly loved Bortles before the draft. Maybe things oh, have changed God. since then. But That's, Bortles is still an NFL caliber start. I mean, you, they, you just want to, you probably just want to have in the room and see if you could fix, right? And if you don't, yeah. then whatever, you move on. Let's do our rapid fire. We can do it. Antonio Brown to the Cardinals, Raiders, or Broncos. Why don't good teams want Antonio Brown? Because he's a lunatic. He's still awesome. He is, but he's manufacturing his way out of Pittsburgh and saying some pretty incendiary things. Yeah, but you're more worried about his blonde mustache. Whilst also appearing on camera with that blonde mustache. 
If you told me nothing else other than the fact that the guy you're about to meet is an all-pro caliber wide receiver, you're, you're probably going to want this guy. And he walked in there with this blonde mustache, black beard, black hair, blonde mustache. I would be like, get the hell out of here. I don't, you're, not, you're not coming into my building. It's not very PFF of you. That's, you're over there hating scouts for face scouting, and you just face scouted. There are some of the greatest, um, some of the greatest insights into players in PFF within the building have been along those lines. Just what, are, what are we even doing here? I, I am saving us from taking a guy with that ridiculous mustache on his face. I take him if he passes the grit test. Drew Locke to Oakland or Denver? That's the rumor. The John Gruden loves Drew Locke. John Gruden loves every quarterback in the world. In public. Behind closed doors, though? Do people not door? remember the Tampa Bay John Gruden era where he because just he signed, hated all of them. signed every quarterback that was That's available? He's like the Sam Monson of, of QB coaches. Then there was John Gruden's quarterback camp where he waxed lyrical about every possible prospect. That's just playing That's just playing the game. I'm just saying, all the evidence we have so far suggests that John Gruden loves quarterbacks. You think quarterbacks. he really liked Chris Sims? He yes. hated Chris Sims. I think he likes anybody that can throw a ball. He's like you. The Sims even have a podcast that if, we can call him out on. If you roll anywhere. up there and you just start pitching things, you immediately love that guy. I was with a bunch of um, Chris Sims colleagues, NBC, because yeah. we've got some crossover with our colleagues at NBC, and I just... I said, look, get me on with Chris. I don't like his takes. Yeah. I'll take him down. I mean, I like Chris. Okay. Respectfully. Uh-huh. But man, football takes, we're going to tear him down. All right. We're going to go head to head with him. This isn't rapid fire at all. Drew no. Locke to Oakland or Denver because, yep, yeah. uh, Le'Veon Bell to the Jets. Does Le'Veon Bell save the Jets? <laughs> no. No, he doesn't. Maybe they just don't, maybe they don't pay too much. He doesn't for save him. any team. It's a good fit if they don't pay too much for Yes. Him. Le'Veon Bell is a great football player who would be a good fit with the Jets as long as he doesn't want a huge amount of money, at which point he's overrated. Wait till he signs and Manish writes that article about how he's going to save the Jets. Yeah, we've got you 10, got Le'Veon. You got 10 wins better today. Le'Veon and Saquon. Hmm. The two running backs carrying the New York teams to four wins apiece. We done? Yeah. I mean, is that all our news? That's it. Oh, Jadavian Clowney. Clowney, franchise tag. A non-exclusive franchise tag. Explain up. Uh, I got Where's it. Where's my franchise tag expert? I got it. I got it. Exclusive is pretty self-explanatory. Yes. You can't talk to anybody else. You have to deal with that team and nobody else. Non-exclusive means you can talk to other teams, and your current team, the Texans, can match that offer. That's right, the if match, If they yeah. don't match the offer, it's two first-round picks. Yeah, nobody does that. Who has two first-round picks to play and a need for edge rushers? The Oakland Raiders. There There's no way go. they would do that. That's the Texans baiting the Raiders absolutely I I, I mean, dare you Mike yes no you know what though remember we, we recently we gave Mike Mayock credit because a couple years ago he put Khalil Mack over Jadavian Clowney in his rankings yeah. he was right how funny would it be by the way if they traded away Khalil Mack only to spend two first round picks getting Clowney to replace him? there's no way that's gonna happen <laughs> there's no way they're gonna take uh, the lesser player in Clowney for those first those two first round picks that they traded that would be incredible there's no way. There's nothing I want to happen more in the offseason. Come now. on. Mike would never let that happen. I mean, no. this is John's show. Mike said John has final authority on personnel decisions. Oh, my God. How quickly do you think he would quit if that happened? <laughs> oh, that would be incredible. I heard some off-the-record stuff about Mayock and some of his interests. Ooh. In the draft. It's got to be off the record, though. Okay. It's a professional tease that I can't even. Yeah, I can't. That's, that's really well done. Nicely. I don't want to hurt. Listen, there's friends that I don't want to hurt. Uh-huh. Right. Guys that inspire us. Right. So good news for anybody listening to this podcast. Sam's going to know. Uh, yeah, I'm going to find out some things after you guys stop listening. I'll, I'll try to find some real dirt that I can share next time. Are yeah. we done now? Yeah. Clowny, franchise tag, non-exclusive. Non-exclusive. We'll talk more about this the rest of the week. We'll have a little bit more draft podcast later in the week. We'll get Mike Renner in here. Keep an eye on the YouTube channel. We're going to do all sorts of fun stuff there. And the draft guide drops this week, Sam. Mm-hmm. It's all almost, part of Edger Elite. Almost 600 prospect profiles in the PFF Draft Guide this year. Um, and you can get it for as little as nine ninety nine with PFF Edge Monthly. Are you giving away the trick? Yeah. I mean, it's not like it was rocket science. Yeah, but some people don't take the time to like study the rockets. If you just do uh-huh. Edge Monthly. Yeah. So all you if have you to do want is a sign draft guide, monthly. you're used to paying $9.99 for your draft guides. You can go get yourself your PFF draft guide by signing up to PFF Edge monthly. 
So you just pay $9.99 and you get the draft guide, which is normally a part of the $40 package or the $200 package. Yeah. You're telling people to just come in and steal it for I'm $9.99. Saying, if what you want is the draft guide, you can get it for $10 bucks and bounce. But you can also pick up the QB annual while yeah. you're in there. For as a free bonus. You can download whatever you want that we've yeah. given away. You're just going to give people that trick. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I've done. So for as little as nine ninety nine, you can get the draft guide and the QB annual. Yeah. It's a pretty good deal. Mm-hmm. So go ahead and check it out. That'll do it for us this week. I'll be back later in the week with Mike Renner. Grit test, go.